So conferences of this nature, and there are some others like it, have uh, turned much of their attention over the last uh, five, ten years to science and technology. In fact, it has become a bit of a cliché. So um, I'm pleased now to turn to a gentleman of letters, and maybe we should see this clip first. Do we have that clip ready? Yes. Yeah. Twenty-ninth of January, nineteen forty-five. My dearest one, I've just heard the news that all the army men who were held POW are to return to their homes. Because of the shipping situation, we may not commence to go before the end of February, but can probably count on being in England sometime in March. It may be sooner. It has made me very warm inside. It is terrific, wonderful, shattering. I don't know what to say, and I cannot think. <laughs> the delay is nothing. The decision is everything. I must spend the first days at home. I must consider giving a party somewhere. Above all, I must be with you. I must warm you, surround you, love you, and be kind to you. I would prefer not to get married, but want you to agree on the point. In battle, I was afraid for you for my mother, for myself. Wait we must, my love and my darling. Let us meet, let us be, let us know, but do not let us now make any mistakes. How good for us to see each other before I am completely bald. I have some fine little wisps of hair on the top of my head. It's not much good me trying to write about recent experiences now that I know I shall be able to tell you everything myself within such a short time. What I have my eye on now is the first letter from you saying that you know I am all right and the next saying you know I am coming to you. Plan a week somewhere, not Boscombe or Bournemouth, and think of being together. The glory of you. I hope that you will not start buying any clothes, if you have any coupons left, because you think you must look nice for me. Just carry on as near as possible to normal. I shall tell my family I hope to spend a week away with you somewhere during my leave. My counsel to you is to tell as few people as possible, to avoid preening yourself and saying much. That is my advice, not anything but that. I hope you understand. I do not ever want it to be anything but our affair. Do not permit any intrusion. I don't know how long leave I shall get. I could get as little as 14 days and I may get as much as a month. I'm wondering how I shall tell you I'm in England. Probably it's still quicker to send a telegram than a letter. And I hope to send you one announcing that I am on the same island. I will send another one I'm actually soon to get on the London bound train and you can ring Lee Green 0509 when you think I have arrived there. It's a strange thing because I cannot seem to get going and write very freely. All I'm thinking about is I am going home, I'm going to see her. It's a fact, a real thing. An impending event like Shrove Tuesday, Christmas Day or the Lord Mayor's Banquet. <laughs> You have to be abroad. You have to be hermetically sealed off from your intimates, from your home, to realize what a gift this going home is. The few letters of yours that I had on me, I burned the day previous to our surrender. So no one but myself has read your words. It is a pity that the winter weather will not be kind to us out of doors but it will be nice sitting next to you in the pictures, no matter what may be on the screen. It will be grand to know we have each other's support and sympathy. Won't it be wonderful to be together, really together in the flesh, not just to know that a letter is all we can send. 
I love you, Chris. So the man of letters that I was referring to is uh, Simon Garfield, and he believes that handwritten letters, old-fashioned handwritten letters, embody emotions that you can simply not duplicate with electronic communication. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Moses. Uh, and terrific uh, to be here. Uh, I'm sorry that um, Benedict Cumberbatch can't be here uh, in person uh, as well. Um, if he was here, he would look like uh, this, or well, this is the guy who wrote uh, the letter that you've, uh, you've just heard. Um, this is a man called uh, Chris Barker, um, and I'll be telling you um, a little bit more uh, about him uh, in a minute. Um, but I can see that quite a few of you here are young, uh, may not have written uh, that many letters. Um, so I thought I'd uh, show you a little uh, instructional uh, a video first uh, about how to address a letter. Good morning, Mrs. Hicks. Oh, good morning. Roses are doing very well, aren't they? What's this? I wrote this letter last week. Let's have a look. Well, you didn't put the name of the town. What do you think we are, thought readers? Seems incredible, doesn't it? But this sort of thing happens every day. Now, this is how it should be done. The name of the town in capital letters, followed by the name of the county. And if it's for abroad, the name of the country in capital letters, and don't forget the right step. It's all very simple, and it saves so much time. Do try, please. I think um, sex and the, uh, and the bike is really what I want to uh, <laughs> hear about next. Um, so I, um, I want to show you this. Um, this is from Catherine Mansfield, uh, written, the short story writer, I'm sure you'll know, uh, written uh, 1922, when letter writing was the only way you could really uh, communi communicate. And uh, what a chore uh, it was. Uh, letters are the real curse of my existence. I hate to write them. I have to. And um, my kids agree. Uh, you can ignore the hooligan there on the left. But basically, um, this, is, um, this is before a Champions League game in uh, Munich. This is soccer. And uh, I talk to them um, uh, a lot about um, letter writing and uh, the, the va value of it. And um, they sort of understand what it is, and they understand the historical value. And I tell them things like, how are we going to tell our history from just texts and tweets? In a hundred years' time, we're going to um, read lots of history books where everyone is on the train. or um, <laughs> it's going to be pictures of cats. Um, we kind of think, OK, well, we've got emails now. Uh, that's a bit of a substitute, but maybe it's not um, the whole. Uh, it's may, maybe that's not quite enough. Um, so I, um, I decided to uh, really write a book which would explain and celebrate the value of letter writing and also ask ourselves, hopefully, um, is this something that we are willing to give up? Now, the key part of this, I think, is uh, love letters, the way that we express our emotions that we don't do in any other form that exists now electronically. We can say, I love you, but uh, it looks the same wherever it's written, uh, it's pixelated, it's a sort of platitude now. 
But a handwritten letter in particular has an incredible uh, value, weight of history. It tells you so much more uh, about uh, the, uh, the writer, the emotion. Uh, is it tear-stained? Is it perfumed? Um, uh, was it written in a great rush? Um, and we've been writing uh, letters to each other, love letters in particular, I think, for 2,000 years. So I was keen to ask whether or not it's something that we are actually really ready to give up, just in the interests of um, speed and efficiency. Um, and uh, I kind of think it's crept upon us Really, the, the decline of letter writing has crept upon us like an English summer, in a way. You know, it's sort of it's there for a short while, and then it disappears. And you kind of think, well, how <clears throat> how have we come to kind of ex accept this uh, fact? So what I uh, tend to do is read my kids uh, the uh, great W. H. Auden uh, poem about the hearts outpouring and uh, the. Um, the, the, the great film that I hope you've seen uh, called The Night Mail, which is all about the romance of letters. And that gets through to them a little, little bit. And then I tend to read them um, this bit, and hopefully this will have some effect on them. I say, letters have the power to grant us a larger life. They reveal motivation and deepen understanding. They are evidential. They change lives and they rewire history. The world once used to run upon their transmission, the lubricant of human interaction and the free fall of ideas, the silent conduit of the worthy and the incidental, the time we were coming for dinner, the account of our marvelous day, the, weightless, the weightiest joys and sorrows of love. It must have seemed impossible that their worth would ever be taken for granted or swept aside. A world without letters would surely be a world without oxygen. And we're just about breathing, I think. And my kids say, hang on a minute, you've got to get a nice pen and nice writing paper, and you've got to sit down on a Sunday afternoon, and you've got to get a stamp, which is going to cost money. Then you've got to get your thoughts in a certain order. Then you've got to um, go to the post box, catch the last post. Then it's two or three days. And then it's three or four days to get a reply. And they say, we sort of get it, Dad. But what are you really talking about? Because they have, um, you know, because we live now in a kind of, uh, in an instant world. And then I try and uh, tell them about this man. Uh, this is, um, hopefully, a few of you will recognized Ted Hughes, a former poet laureate. Um, he wrote not only uh, some really extraordinary uh, poetry, but I think, was, I think letter writing was, was as, as good. The letters he left were as good as uh, his uh, poems. And I, I want to read you one that was written <coughs> to uh, the girl here on the left. Uh, this is Sylvia Plath. Uh, his son, Nick, their son, Nick, is in her hands. And this is uh, Frida Hughes um, uh, in uh, 1961. She's now, uh, she, was, she was just coming up to two uh, there, I think. And um, the letter that, that I, I kind of think um, really sums up um, a love um, to his daughter is one that isn't about anything hugely important. If you were looking at Ted Hughes's letters over time, you would say, OK, well, maybe this isn't even in the top 100 greatest letters. It doesn't really sort of say anything truly significant, apart from the fact that it's a beautiful letter. Now, Frida Hughes, who is now a painter, uh, mid-50s, um, went to a progressive school uh, called Beedales, and uh, I, I have a friend who went there, and he explained to me how you used to get letters. It would be mid-morning break, you had to cross a quad, uh, then if you were lucky enough to get anything from home, again, obviously the only communication that you really got, you wouldn't read it there and then. You would sort of scurry away, maybe wait till the lunch break, scur scurry away, read it maybe in your dorm or in the library. And this is what Frida Hughes um, 
read in um, 1975, um, at the end of the Sama term, Dear Frida, how did the exams go? Did you manage to get into a nice, fluent gallop with your answers? The rain came just as we were finishing loading the bales. I should say Ted Hughes is in the, the West Country, um, uh, avoiding sort of uh, the pressures of land and life and doing a bit of farming. We had a wild rush to get the bales in. Bales into the Land Rover, bales into Jean and Ian's van, bales into the horse box, bales into our ears, bales into the backs of our necks, bales in our boots, bales down our shirts. So we totted home, towering and trembling, and tilting and toppling and teetering. And there in front of us was some other tractor, creeping along with a trailer loaded twice as high as ours, like a skyscraper. All over the countryside, there were desperate tractors crawling home under impossible last loads in the very green rain. It's still raining now, Thursday evening. And here we are, all aches and stretched joints, like broken down five-bar gates after our bailing. And here are all the holidaymakers, sitting in their sauna bath cars under the downpour, staring at the sea, with their transistors turned up and their ice cream uh, running down to their elbows, like cars stuck in a car washer. See you very soon, love, Daddy. Um, no wonder Frida kept that letter. Um, I think uh, my father is no longer alive. I think those are the sorts of... Uh, and I don't have any letters uh, from him, oddly enough, because we were very close, but I think that would be uh, a, a fantastic uh, memory um, to, to have. Um, and that really, as I said, is not you know, a hugely important, um, uh, significant uh, note, but it's something that is just a general uh, expression. So I'm going to go back here. Um, now, Matthew Barber talked about uh, never going near the lake. This is uh, Virginia Woolf and Clive Bell um, in, uh, in Dorset in uh, 1908. I never really picture as, uh, Virginia Woolf as, uh, as, a, as a sort of beach type of girl, uh, but here she is. It's a poignant photo because it didn't end well for Virginia, as you know. She committed suicide um, in uh, 1941, and um, she drowned herself uh, in the River Ouse. And, um, in the course uh, of, um, of, of, of my uh, researches, um, I went to see um, some auctioneers who had valuable letters, and I went to see a dealer in New York. And uh, he had a collection of letters from Virginia Woolf that didn't include her famous suicide note, but included other love letters, which I think are even more significant, a sequence of letters, which to hold is an incredibly valuable historical thing, something, again, we'd never have the opportunity to do with technology, even if we got beyond firewalls and passwords and clouds. Um, you kind of think this kind of thing uh, is uh, the reason that we still uh, need to, um, to write uh, letters and keep the historical uh, record. Um, this is um, Leonard Wolf writing to um, Virginia's girlfriend, although we didn't quite know the extent of their uh, relationship at the time, Vita Sackville West, and it's self-explanatory. I do not want you to see in the paper or hear possibly on the wireless the terrible thing that has happened to Virginia. She has been really very ill these last weeks and was terrified that she was going mad again. It was, I suppose, the strain of the war and finishing her book, and she could not rest or eat. Today, she went for a walk, leaving behind a letter saying that she was committing suicide. I think she has drowned herself as I found her stick floating in the river, but we have not found the body. I know what you will feel and what you felt for her. She was very fond of you. She has been through hell these last days. Again, wonderful expression uh, of, of love. When I was doing my book, I had a problem. I had, as you've heard, Virginia Woolf, Ted Hughes, huge amount of other famous people going all the way back to Cicero, 
and Seneca, and right up to the modern day. What I wanted to show was um, some letters that were written by unknown people, ordinary people, uh, but yet which showed the power of letter writing to transform uh, lives. And that's where Benedict um, came in. Um, I, I'm a trustee of something called the Mass Observation uh, Archive, which is at the University of Sussex, wonderful collection of life writing that began uh, just before the Second World War. And um, about two weeks before I had to hand my book in, um, I called them up and said, we don't by any chance have anything new that I haven't seen. And the woman who runs the archive said, yeah, absolutely we do. We have this extraordinary letter, uh, series uh, of letters. Um, uh, it looks like this. And here are the two people who wrote them. Chris Barkey, you've already seen, and you've heard Benedict re read one of his letters. And this is Bessie Moore. The extraordinary thing about this collection was not that they'd been riding to each other um, sort of over, over the years as kind of old friends or a married couple. But um, he, because it was all you did when you were bored in 1941 on the, on, the north, uh, on the north coast of Africa, you wrote a lot of letters. And he basically uh, wrote uh, to everyone he knew, and one of them was Bessie Moore, who he used to work with at the post office before he got called up. And um, he said, hi, how are you? How, how's Nick? She wrote back two weeks later saying, oh, I'm fine. Nick, her fiancé at the time, is no longer around. And I've always had a bit of a thing for you. Um, <laughs> so after two months, this develops into the most extraordinary passion, falling in love through the mail. They hardly knew each other. There's one letter where he actually says, can I see a photograph of you? Um, and um, I, I went down to the mass observation. I, I started reading these letters, 500 in all. I had tears in my eyes. And um, I, uh, I kind of thought, OK, I know what we're going to do here. We're going to interleave them uh, between the chapters that I'd already uh, written. Um, which is great, and people loved them. In fact, they loved them so much that what happened was they tended to skip the main chapters that I'd spent <laughs> a year and a half working on just to uh, see what happened next. Anyway, it had a, uh, I shouldn't maybe spoil it, but it had a, a, a very good outcome, and it turns out that, that, I mean, you'll know this because the letters um, were donated uh, by, their, by their kids, and they, they were married for 50 years, and it's the most extraordinary, intense, passionate relationship. People often ask me, what's your favorite uh, letter? What letter do you, do you love the most? And um, it's this one, Edward Manet, 1879. I've got no idea what it says. This is another reason for, keep, to, for us to keep sending letters. Wouldn't it be extraordinary to receive a letter uh, from Edward Manet with plums and cherries on it. I tried to buy this letter. I thought, okay, so I'm going to get advanced from my book. You know, what a wonderful thing to have as a memento. And I thought, how much is it going to cost? Maybe £5,000, £6,000. That would be all right. My wife wouldn't kill me too much. Um, and uh, I went to the dealer. It was on a London art fair. And I think they wanted £180,000 for this. Um, and no uh, wonder. Um, I've got two or three very, very quick uh, things uh, to, to leave you with. Some bad news and, and some bad news, I hope. This is the bad news. The Canadian Postal Service uh, announced uh, a year ago that they thought that within five years, they would no longer be making personal deliveries of letters to, uh, to your houses. And I think this is an extraordinary thing. You have to go and pick up your mail. You would still get your online deliveries. All that will be fine. The trucks would roll by. But in terms of personal mail, they didn't think it was economically viable anymore. Emails, OK, I said maybe we've got emails. Not really the answer. Uh, there's been a lot of research done. Again, we look at, you know, you obviously have to look at your kids. You look at young people and the patterns that are emerging, and you say, this is what's going to happen. They mostly think now that emails, and tell me if I'm wrong, if they're, you know, sort of people in the audience who, who haven't sent letters, are a passing phase. Uh, they are too much of a 
effort. You've got to be quite formal. You've got to have an address bar. You've got to be careful where you send it, not press send, return to everybody. And you've got to sit down. And, and I know you can sort of do it on the move, but why do emails when you can do Instagram and texting and tweeting? So we're not even going to have that record. Um, the good news is that we know now in this room, we've known it for a long time, uh, that um, actually letters are far more than just communication. This is not a letter, but my arms around you for a moment. And that's what we feel, I think, when we receive a letter. Emails are a chore. Uh, you get a letter, and it's now a gift, and it's such a rare thing, along with the junk mail and everything else, that you kind of think, okay, this is, uh, this is now a personal thing. When I write a letter back, I kind of think I'm doing something uh, good and rare and um, valuable. And I want to leave you with... Oops, uh, I never thought that I would end a talk um, talking about the Queen Mum, or indeed write anything in my book talking uh, about the Queen Mum. Um, but um, she wrote, I think, pretty much more thank you letters in one person's life than maybe anyone else would ever write. And these were great expressions of, of gratitude for her uh, gifts that she got, wherever she went, obviously inundated. Um, and I kind of thought these would be quite cursory things. Turned out, wasn't the case at all. Um, so she would take great care. My favorite thank you letter that she wrote was one where she received a box of chocolates. And you think, OK, someone gets a box of chocolates. You think, um, thanks for the chocolates, and really lovely seeing you. But she went through every single chocolate in the box <laughs> and said, I can't believe that the, uh, the walnut cream was better than the orange delight. So I had visions of her sitting up in bed, Barbara Cartland style, just sort of <laughs> eating each one. Um, if I leave you with, with one thing uh, today, it's, it's, um, it's my favorite sign-off. It's how to, you know, hopefully be a little bit inspired and maybe hopefully get back into uh, letter writing. Um, my favorite sign-off um, of all time, again, from uh, the Queen Mum. Um, she had a friend um, who lost her brother in 1941. Um, Queen Mum was great during the Blitz. She hung around in uh, London, and she showed uh, great um, sub support for everyone who had been bombed. And she wrote in this letter of consolation, I'm so sorry that you have lost your uh, brother. And, uh, you know, I, I hear so many tragic stories. And every time a bomb drops in London, she said, my heart still hammers. And she signed the letter. And I think this is, uh, as I said, you know, I, I think something that we need to um, all remember and use. Now, pretty much every letter, she signed it, Tinkety Tonk Old Fruit and Down with the Nazis. <laughs> so thank you very much for listening. <laughs>